Hello everyone and welcome to the HPA Young Entertainment Professionals webinar. Uh, they're also known as YEPs. I'd um, like to welcome you and welcome our speakers. The uh, topic tonight is color theory and the art of color. I'd like to thank the YEPs from, for putting this uh, webinar together. I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping and then turn the floor over to your uh, moderator, Jennifer Zayden. Um, first of all, if uh, you would like to ask a question of our speakers this evening, um, please uh, consider asking a verbal question. Uh, you just uh, type into the question box, say, I would like to ask a verbal question, and when the time comes for the Q&A, which um, will be at the end of uh, each segment, uh, we have two, two segments tonight, um, uh, when, you, uh, when it's time for questions, I will unmute you. You can ask your question verbally, and then um, the speaker will respond, and then I'll remute you. If you don't have a microphone or you prefer not to uh, ask a verbal question, you are more than welcome to type your question in, and I will read the question on your behalf. Um, also, we are recording the uh, web webinar tonight, so uh, we will make the on-demand video available to you um, as quickly as we can. And there will also be a survey uh, that I will send out to folks um, sometime after the uh, web uh, webinar so that uh, you can provide your feedback. And that feedback is very important to us to ensure that we continue to cover the topics that uh, you want to uh, have covered, but also that we continue to do the things that work, stop doing the things that don't work for you, and just uh, overall guarantee that uh, we are doing the best job that we possibly can. So please give us your feedback. Without further delay, I would like to hand the floor over to your moderator, Miss Jennifer Zayden. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Joel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to their second of four webinars for the YEP program that we are putting together this year. Uh, my name is Jen, and I am the co-chair of the YEP program. And for those of you who do not know us, the Young Entertainment Professionals Group was started by the Hollywood Professional Association about two years ago to attract and mentor individuals young in their careers by introducing them to work, working professionals and mentors, connecting them with events and resources such as this that will help develop their skills and their careers and encourage them to be active in the larger industry organizations such as SMT and HPA. We have three pillars, collaboration and community, mentorship and education. And through these webinars, we find it important to be able to extend education to the industry at large. So with that said, I'd like to introduce you to today's topic, the art and science of color. While we won't be doing a deep dive into the science of it all, we do have Joseph from PhotoChem. He is the VP and Principal Color Scientist joining us for the beginning of our webinar, who will give us an, int an introduction and overview of color. Then we have the privilege of having Nick, a colorist from Technicolor, walking us through the art of a final color, demonstrating on a black magic resolve system, as well as talking us through the thought process of a colorist as he or she color grades. Finally, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Black Magic Design for providing us the demo space and equipment to make this all possible today. With that, I'll pass it off to Joseph and Brandy, one of our YEPs. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you guys for joining us. We are going to jump into the color science portion. Um, so Joseph, just wanting to start off with a few basic questions. Uh, starting at the beginning, can you describe from a technical perspective how the human eye perceives color and what is a color space? Well, one of the things I'd like to start off with is um, thinking of the human eye, but also when you think of color, color is not so much um, something that can be captured like with a camera. The whole aspect of color is a perception. So if everyone wants to kind of bear with me and look at this beautiful full screen uh, flag and just kind of stare at the black dot in the center for uh, 30 seconds, um, you know, as we talk, is the idea is that what you see um, what you have just seen affects how you see other colors. So as you're, um, as you're going through life, if you are walking outside and it's incredibly bright and sunny, you look underneath a car, the shadow under a car may be brighter than the office building you walk into, but your eye adjusts um, to each environment. So the shadow under the car looks like a shadow, even though it may be brighter than anything you see in an office. So it's important to think of color as being part of a whole system where you have uh, the observer interacting with the environment and the environment interacting with the observer. And uh, 
and to get an idea of what you're to get an idea of what you're seeing. So, um, I'm you know, committed to staring at the center of it. You're committed yes. to staring at it. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to uh, change up the image, and if you're if you've stared at it long enough, <laughs> you now see a red, white, and blue uh, normal-looking flag that is quickly fading away. And I think for this is one of the best things to understand for colorists is that what you have seen affects what you will see. So the idea is that you had the sensation of color. You can you were looking at a completely flat gray image that is technically even across the whole edge, but yet you were seeing a normal full color image. So. Um, what, when, when we talk about color, we tend to talk about um, the way to approximate the first level of the human visual system, and that's pretty much in uh, understanding the long, medium, and short wavelength capture for um, uh, long, like long is red, medium is green, and then short wavelength is going to be blue light. The idea is in that that correlates to something. We try to um, design our cameras in a way that um, can record color, not too differently from how the I first would perceive it. Interesting. I was just excited that I actually saw what you were trying to tell me. <laughs> um, so we hear a lot of what we'll call buzzwords um, in regards to color that each pertain to a different type of delivery. So can you give us a quick overview between the differences of say a log image versus DCI-P3 versus Rec. 709 versus XYZ? Why do we have so many and kind of what do they mean in a very broad sense? Well, all of the different uh, color spaces that we have all fulfill different purposes inside the pipeline. So, um, so for instance, a log space can refer to something that's captured in, um, in a, what, what people will call a log format. Which is a, a film, which is a film negative-like capture. So digital cameras have a log format, as well as it originated in the capture of film. Uh, DCI-P3 is a special case. It's a color space made by the Digital Cinema Initiative program that uh, post-production facilities and uh, ex uh, exhibition theaters use to determine that everyone's seeing the same colors and everything's being reproduced faithfully between. So it's a very specialized color space that pretty much only exists in a color grading suite and a theater. So out of curiosity then, just to break in, if that is how you describe DCI-P3, then what is the purpose of XYZ? Well, XYZ is the actual encoding space. So P3 uh, is a way of describing the RGB color values as they're displayed to a projector. The XYZ color space is the encoding space of uh, the DCP. XYZ is actually meant to represent these long, medium, and wavelength colors that the human eye perceives. So the whole idea is that it can describe every color that someone can see. And the point of that is that if someone comes out in the future with more capable projectors, that the old DCPs will play on those without um, necessary modification, and the new ones won't have to have a different type of encoding in order to take advantage of it. Interesting. Okay. And then, so... What about Rec. 709? It's the one that I feel like most people have heard of the most. Rec. 709 is the broad, was the broadcast television standard for decades and decades. So the idea of Rec. 709 is it gave all of the post facilities and studios and broadcast facilities uh, a standard that they could all get around. It's actually um, called BT. So it stands for Broadcast uh, Telecommunications. So it's, it's actually a broadcast telecommunications standard. Okay. And the idea is that it was how all HD TVs were able to produce color. Now, one of the things that this gets into is now that we have BT 2020, which is a bigger color space. The problem with Rec. 709 is that cameras and televisions could quickly make uh, colors that went outside of the standard Rec. 709. There's no way to describe them as a mastering facility, as a broadcast facility. You just know you hit vivid and everything gets more saturated, but you don't necessarily um, have good control over it. So what the REC 2020 standard does is it vastly increases the total amount of color saturation that can be accurately described in a broadcast signal. So now that these colors that were just vivid and they kind of went wherever they, wherever they could go, filmmakers and uh, creatives and uh, television producers can now pick exactly what they want that to look like on televisions that are capable. Okay. And to, in order to avoid the problem they had with 709, the BT 2020 standard is significantly bigger than what current TVs can produce. So the idea is that in the future, when they get more capacity 
to display saturated colors that they don't have to yet again redefine a new encoding standard and the new ways of describing those colors. Okay, so just to kind of recap on that, are you saying then DCI-P3, XYZ, these are more theatrical elements, whereas Rec. 709 is more of a monitor environment or at home kind of? Yeah, it'll be it'll be at home as well as um, it's adopted by streaming services. Okay. Or, or not necessarily streaming services, but the mobile devices that sh that services can run on. Okay. So the idea is that um, almost every phone is very very close to a Rec. 709 display. So media that's encoded for Rec. 709 on television is going to look okay on a phone and and vice versa. Okay. Um, so how does gamma play a part, and what exactly are the options? So there are tons and tons of options. Is the GUI of, um, visible? Fantastic. So what I have here is I have uh, just a standard um, gradient image here that goes from black all the way to white, and it has a, a particular look. And um, I have a waveform scope up here, so you can see that from zero to maximum, it, uh, it's a nice straight line. So when you get to... Hmm. This worked just a second ago. There we go. So um, what, what the gamma is going to introduce, so right here, if you look at, I'm very quickly doing a Rec. 709 gamma 2.4 to P3 DCI gamma 2.6. So I'm kind of mixing two elements here. We'll switch that to P3 D65 for just a second so we don't look at the color skew. But the idea is you can see that this curve is is bending. And gamma represents the way that a particular display device bends color from a, on a tone scale. So you've got, so for instance, you've got that, you've got that over there, you've got Rec. 709, and then this is to another standard for high dynamic range, um, SD2084. So you can see that this has a very, very different look. And each of the gammas that are used are designed to be used with a particular display device. So disabling this here and then going back here, this is um, this is how to this gamma 2.6 is what's used for um, P for P3 and theatrical encoding, uh, and then when you get to here, you understand that this is uh, this SMPTE 2084 is designed to be used with high dynamic range monitors, where it looks very very dark and gray here, but on an HDR display, it'll have a very bright um, natural looking appearance. Okay, so it, um, if I'm understanding correctly, then if you're going in for like a gamma 2.6 theatrical environment, environment, is that because it's assuming a much darker environment versus say gamma 2.2 that might be expecting a bit of a brighter environment? Yeah, so the way that the gamma is used, um, it, it corresponds with display technology, but it also is suited to the, uh, the viewing environment that's at hand. So you have high gammas uh, in very, very dark environments. Mm -hmm. Because when everything is dark, remember that you see things in relation to each other. If you're in a dark environment, you actually have more ability to perceive small gradations and shadows. So the higher gamma gives you a little more control when placing those values in the low areas. And then when you get into a um, brighter environment, like a, like a dim home living room, you have gamma 2.4. And then you get all the way up to gamma 1.8, which is meant to be like looked at uh, in, for sRGB, which is meant to be like in an office type scenario. So that's, that's one of the ways that uh, the color science is being used to help adapt the user and the environment to the, uh, to the color transforms. Very cool. Well, why don't we open it up to a few questions? Very good. Well, we we do have one. Yes, we do. We have a question from Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy says, uh, hi, Joseph. Uh, what's the difference between gamma 2.4 and gamma rec 709 in resolve color space transform? You will need to ask a black magic engineer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Um, I, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't want to speak on that, on a black magic stage. Okay. Um, I have a, a, a question. Uh, a term that is being uh, used quite often uh, these days is uh, color volume. How does color volume impact what the colorist does? Color volume is another way of describing color gamut, and that's kind of an important concept. So a color gamut, um, the way that a particular device produces and captures colors, and they mean slightly different things. So the color volume or color gamut on a display indicates the maximum, for instance, on a normal display, maximum red, the maximum green saturation, the maximum blue saturation you can get. 
which means that's the most saturated color that you can uh, produce physically, and the idea is you can pr reproduce everything inside of that. So the, um, that's how a display device works. On a capture device, color volume works a little differently. It's the, if you have an out of gamut color on a capture device, you don't get like a little black spot, but what happens is you can't differentiate that from a different color. So the whole point is if you have a red and a slightly more saturated red, if the, color of the, the gamut of the camera isn't large enough to capture that, what you have is you just have two of the same color as opposed to color differentiation. So having good color capture volume is uh, important in the DI process because the idea is you want to be able to have as much differentiation as possible and kind of let the colorist decide if they want to sm smush those together or they want to pull them apart. Um, so that becomes an important tool to be able to understand, you know, the subtle nuances. On the other hand, you want to make sure um, that your makeup and everything is being done in such a way on the principle of photography that you don't have people's skin tones starting to pull way apart and then something becomes ungradably difficult. So having an extensively huge color space, like capturing an XYZ would become a bad idea because it would start creating huge gradients and difference between, you know, uh, the different areas on a person's face and um, color capture gamuts, like the, most camera manufacturers are calling them cine gamuts, which wind up being pretty close to Rec 2020 gamuts, uh, is a much more reasonable way of working. Uh, for years and years, mo a lot of cinema cameras actually captured a high dynamic range version of Rec 709, because Rec 709 was such a natural color space being developed over broadcast television, it worked very, very well in terms of being able to be worked with and reproduced and people understanding how to light and how to do uh, makeup and composition inside that. Very so good. Did that, uh, did that get the, did that address the question? Yes, yes. And we okay. do have a couple of questions from our guests, uh, from John. Um, where does the Academy Color Encoding System, ACES, uh, fit in with uh, Rec 2020 and other color spaces? So um, ACES is, what ACES is, ACES is a color management system for motion pictures. Um, so for people who aren't familiar with the ACES project, uh, the Academy um, of Sci Tech Council Sci, um, came up with a, kind of a best practices way of getting everyone in the industry together to try to understand what we were all doing and come up with a standard set of ways of doing those same tasks. So the idea is that ACES can leverage use of, for instance, a REC 2020 output transform uh, to be able to produce something for, a, rec, for a, um, a 2020 television as well as a 709 as well as going to film output. So what the ACES system does is give you a very consistent, clear way of getting between all of these different types of deliverables from a single source. Otherwise, you need basically a color scientist or to use something built in uh, color science like into Resolve in order to do these transforms. By having them all defined and having them all published in a certain way, that means everyone's on equal footing, which makes consistent work is the best kind of color work. It's the idea is that it's going to look the same every time you go to a different device and every time you go to a different uh, facility as well. Okay, great. So ACES leverages these technologies as part of being a color managed system. Excellent. Um, Jesse asks, uh, in your experience, have you seen any theatrical releases made for 2.4 or is 2.6 pretty much the standard? The way that the, um, the material is encoded, everything is displayed at 2.6 no matter what. So the DCP encoding process um, requires an XYZ 2.6 deliverable. Uh, if you've worked and done your projection calibration for your grading in 2.4, you will have a different looking image than you graded when you see it displayed. So you can work in a 2.4 and then do a technical conversion to make that appropriate for the 2.6, but if you set your projector up for 2.4 and the master your material at 2.4 and then send it to DCP creation, you're gonna have a mismatch in what you saw versus what you get. Thank you. Uh, Jacob asks, um, what is the working color space you would advise to use in Resolve? It depends on the project and what the deliverables are. So I like to make sure that we use the right tools for the right for the right project. So if we would get a very simple behind the scenes project, it could be simple enough to work in Rec 709 if all of the material was already captured in that kind of space. For uh, any of the mainline cinema cameras, there's, there's a whole variety. I typically like working in a manufacturer's native recommended space. 
Mm -hmm. So the idea is you would use the red recommendations for the red camera, Canon recommendations for Canon, Sony for Sony, and Area Log C for that, uh, for the for the Area cameras. So the idea is um, to make sure that you you stick with it because typically they also design their LUTs to work very nicely with those. So um, that's usually my starting space recommendation. So can I ask a question then in that same vein as well? What happens when you end up with a feature that has used 20 different cameras and you're bringing it into something like Resolve, you would recommend working in the native environment even though you're working with several different cameras on a, on a cut? No. Okay. So that's, that's, a, that's a really good um, exception to that. So the idea is whatever the primary camera is, because usually there's a hero camera, mm -hmm. um, whatever that is, I would, I would recommend people work in that log and then all of the other cameras are converted into that. So um, Blackmagic has a series of tools here where you can convert from, so for instance, you could, you know, drag and color two, and then you can convert into, um, you know, for instance, Canon, Canon Cinema Gamut if you were working with, uh, if you had a red insert into a Canon show, and this, this tool works vice versa. And that gets you into a very good starting place to be able to have all of your material react in the same way. So each different log space as you turn the controls and use your, um, and use the modifications to the image inside Resolve, they're all gonna react differently based on how they're log encoded. So the idea is you wanna have all the material feel the same. So when, right. you're, when you're turning the controls, you just wanna make sure that a little bit of blue just adds a little bit of blue and doesn't skyrocket off on one and then have almost no effect on another shot. So that's the idea of bringing everything into a common working space. And Jacob did ask a, a similar question. He said, but what if the cameras are mixed? So I think you asked that question as well. Um, and that is our final question um, from, uh, from our guests for the time being. Um, if, uh, let's see, uh, there are no other questions, then uh, I guess uh, we move on to the next speaker. Is that correct? Sounds good. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much, Joseph. So this is Nick Hassan, who is one of our star colorists over at Technicolor. <laughs> Thank you. Take it away. All right. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about final color, the art of color, and what that consists of. So there's usually two steps of, to color correction in projects. There's usually the dailies color and then what we call final color. And the difference <clears throat> is a lot more than just one is done in the dailies process and one is actually your final. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the environment, where you're color correcting in, um, what you're working in, and what you're viewing on. So <clears throat> one of the things that is essential for final color is an environment that is friendly to your work. So you want to have a room that's very neutral in color. Usually we're working in a room that's uh, painted completely black. Um, a lot of times we have a 16% gray wall that's in the front of the room. Um, this would be for a room that's using a monitor. Uh, rather than a, a theater, you know, you want to have the room be neutral and not influence your color corrections in any way. If you were to paint a room bright red and start color correcting with all the lights on in the room, you would find that your image would start to veer very blue because you're going to start compensating for what is in the room. So, you know, a proper room for grading uh, Rec 709 content on a monitor, which is what most people will be doing, is you know having an 18% uh, gray in the back, as well as a backlight behind your monitor. So you don't want to grade in a, for a monitor in a completely dark environment because that's not what most people will see it in. So there is technical specs to how much light and things like that, and the color of that light. It's a very neutral light that matches uh, what's coming off the monitor. Um, so you want to make sure that that is that is set how you also want to look at your distance to your monitor um, where you're seeing it uh, you want to be about midway through the screen you want to be a certain uh, distance behind it so there's there's a number of those things and you'll see when you go into a lot of post houses um, that there is uh, kind of a common theme there if you if you were to just go on the web and and look at some of the uh, bigger post-production houses you could see kind of a, a common theme there a lot of gray walls a lot of dark walls the backlights behind the monitor things like that so that that's kind of where you start with final color is having that environment now if you're in a theatrical environment and you're grading in in the theatrical environment there's other things that are gonna um, you're gonna be in that same same mindset so you're gonna be 
in a dark theater, you're usually going to have walls that, that are uh, neutral in color. Um, if you're grading in a, in a theater, you're also going to uh, grade on what's called a non-perf screen. So there's two types of screens that happen in theatrical world. There's one that's called perf and one that's non-perf. And a perf screen actually has tiny little holes in it because what they're doing with that is they're actually putting the speakers behind the screen. So that is great for audio, for viewing, but that's not great for actual color correction and grading. So we, we in color correction suites that are theatrical, uh, we land up using uh, non-perf screens. So the screens don't have any holes in them. They don't cause any kind of uh, reflection. The perfs a lot of times will cause a, a moiré. So you'll always see in a lot of grading suites, all the speakers are on the floor. Um, because in a grading suite, you're not really worried about sound. You know, you want good sound, but it's not an environment to judge sound. Um, and then when you go into a mixed stage and you're doing it in a mixed environment, you'll see that they will have the speakers up behind the screens and they'll be mixing in a different way because they have a different priority. Um, so <clears throat> that is one of the things to think about is where you're in. And then the other main thing is to think about what you're viewing on. So most people will be color correcting on some sort of monitor. Um, a lot of the uh, people have moved into OLEDs. The LG and the Panasonics are very uh, common these days. Um, now, you can't just take one of these and pull it out of a box and put it on the wall and call it ready to grade. You know, there's a process of calibrating these TVs. So the same way you've now calibrated your room, you want to take this monitor and you want to calibrate that. And there's a number of ways that you can do that from a cheap way to, a, you know, very expensive ways. Um, any way that you do it is better than nothing. Um, so that's always something to think about. And that's, you know, what host houses are good at. So they will go and have somebody take a probe and they will put up a specific shade of red, green, blue, white, gray, black. And they will read that on the monitor and they will adjust the monitor to where that monitor now shows that in the color space you're working in the way it should be. So now you have a monitor, usually it's going to be Rec 709 um, for standard dynamic range. And they will set the green to be the perfect green, the perfect red, the perfect blue, the perfect white, the perfect black, and the perfect brightness. So that's kind of where color starts, uh, is getting you know the environment and then the display. And then the theat theatrical side of things, it's the same process, um, just different mediums. So they will uh, shoot the same thing. They will shoot the screen with a probe. They will read a red, green, blue, and uh, put those numbers into the projectors. And projectors are a little smarter than monitors. The projector will then auto calibrate that based on what the, the probe has read and, and told us. So that's kind of where you start with final color is your environment. Um, that's why, you know, I always try to remind people that's why host houses cost money um, because they have these people that do this every day. So for myself, I spend most of my time in a theatrical environment grading in a theater. Uh, I grade in DCI P3 and every morning I have someone that comes in, reads the screen, sets up the projector so I know that my brightness is the right level, my colors are the right level, and we're seeing everything in the absolute best perfect environment you, you, you can. So that's a great place to start, um, getting your environment into that. Into that. Um, and then there's, there's, you know, what you can actually do in color. So color is morphed over the years and what people want to do in a color room, but it comes down to mostly the basics. So you have brightness, contrast, saturation, uh, you know, heavy saturation, less saturation. Um, you know, you have uh, uh, the ability to manipulate mood, to manipulate time of day. Um, we spend a lot of times in features looking at story, uh, what is going to do best for the story, what is going to be best for the viewer, um, and then looking at internally inside the story things like time of day. Where are we in the story? You know, maybe you guys had to run and gun and shoot something in the hot sun in the middle of the day, but in the story, it's really later in the evening or earlier in the morning. So we're gonna take those things into consideration when coming up with looks for, uh, for different uh, scenes. So there's a lot of different things you can do, um, even down to you know mood. Um, a horror movie, for example. 
a horror movie was bright and you could see everything, it wouldn't quite be the same as if it was dark and scary, you know, and you don't want to see, uh, even down to certain parts of the image, you know, um, a horror mo movie maybe using wires to trigger doors opening and things like that, little practical effects. Now, if it's super bright, you're going to see all that and it's not going to scare you. But uh, if it's dark, you'll, you'll see that. It'll help create the mood. So those are uh, another thing you can do with color. Um, now, the jobs of a colorist varies these days, um, but overall, we're there for two things. We're your uh, creative ambassador, we'll say. So we're there to translate what your, what your needs are for your project, add to that creativity, and come up with a final look. But we're also there to make sure the technical aspects of your project is taken care of. So. Um, anything from color spaces, you know, making sure that you're uh, legal, that you're not breaking um, outside the bounds of what's technically possible. Uh, for instance, Rec 709 um, is a color space that's broadcast on TV. It's become much better now that you have digital, uh, digital, um, digital delivery. Um, but, you know, in, in the earlier days, if you were to color correct something too bright, it may actually bleed and it may actually cause distortion. Or if you had too much saturation, it may cause a distortion across the broadcast as well. Um, the other thing too with the, those is a broadcast is only capable of doing certain colors. So if you come into our color suite and we go crazy and we color correct it in something that a broadcast can't recreate, when your project hits broadcast, you will never, ever, ever see what you saw in the room. So that's partly what a colorist is there to do is to make sure that you know that technical those technical things are um, there for you and you know that's a broadcast world but there's also these days very a lot of, of uh, deliverables a lot of different color spaces as they were talking about so typically for me a project starts in, in DCI P3 in a theater and we'll color grade a, a, a movie depends on depending on the budget anywhere from two days to two months. So um, we'll take that, whatever that final is, and then it's my job to translate that into all the other color spaces and maintain that look and feel that you've created. So a lot, the, the main primary transform, we'll start in DCI P3, and then we'll move on to Rec 709, onto a monitor. And you know, there's everyone talks about color space conversion, but there's also something to uh, the display device. So the way a projector feels is much different than the way a monitor feels. So if I just take a mathematical calculation and convert DCI P3 to Rec 709, I may not get the exact same feel because I've got to take into account the fact that you set these looks and did these grades in a theater on a projector at a certain light level. Now we move to a, to a monitor. There's certain things we're going to do to help that kind of maintain that look. Um, that's the standard dynamic range world. Now we're getting into high dynamic range, which is another creative choice that people can make. Uh, sometimes they just want their project to translate from SDR to HDR and look the same. So that's, you know, a challenge. And sometimes there's a creative difference and you want to use that HDR and push it and do different things. So there's, there's different ways, but it's a colorist job to maintain that continuity um, above and you know, between all the color spaces so that you sh shouldn't have to think about that as a, as a client, you know, the colorist should be taking care of that. And with that, you know, making all the deliverables that you need, uh, there's many deliverables these days, especially for some of the streaming services, you may have Dolby Vision and you may have a standalone Rec 709 and you may have uh, different HDR and SDR requirements. And, and then down to, we still do pan and scans, so you may have different aspect ratios. Uh, that's another thing most colorists do is um, we will do the old pan and scan, which you know a lot of you remember seeing four by three come up and it would say this film has been modified to fit your screen. So that's another thing that we do. Um, that's getting less and less these days and a lot easier because four by three has gone out of the way. So now we're just usually dealing with a 178 deliverable for uh, 16 by nine TVs. But a lot of movies are shot 239, so we will take that 239 and convert it and make sure that you hear the story points because there is, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. A good example was uh, 
Alexander Payne's Nebraska. There was a very long shot in there that's there's about 12 people in a room and they're all sitting in the room and the joke is that the room is kind of stagnant and no one's saying anything and it's this one long shot that's two minutes long and it becomes almost the, the composition becomes part of the joke. So when we landed up having to go to a four by three, we couldn't fit all of that into one shot. So what we landed up doing is cutting that into about eight different shots. Whoever was talking in the room became a single shot in, in the, the actual in the actual show. So the pacing now has changed, the comedy has now changed. Um, so you know that's another thing a colorist does is the, the, the pan and scan and, and trying to maintain that as, as much as possible. Um, the other thing that we're responsible for is time management. Um, like I said, there's movies that I do where we get two, three days to grade a movie. And you have to have a different approach to grading a movie when you have three days to when you have three weeks or three months. So you have to, as a colorist, know the limitations and the expectations and manage that. And with that is also managing the personalities in the room. You're going to have a DP, you're going to have a producer, you're going to have a director, and they may all have a different uh, vision of what the movie is going to be. And it's your job as a colorist to kind of play moderator and uh, find a common area. Now, a lot of productions, they'll just put it in the hands of the director or of the director of photography, and they will have that, that say. And um, so you work with them closely. And you also have to learn being a colorist is part psychological. So I need to understand a client, what they mean when they say, hey, can you brighten that image up? Does that mean a tiny bit of brightness? Does that mean brighten it a lot? Um, and you learn those things as you get, and as you work with the person. You, the more and more you work with them, the more and more do you kind of understand what they need and what they're looking for and, and where they're going. Um, so you also learn their personal style, whether they like heavy contrast, whether they don't like heavy contrast. Um, whether they want to crush their blacks or you know leave detail in the blacks, so you, you learn all of that. But that's part of part of being a, a colorist is managing the time, managing the room, managing the people, and helping them get their project finished. Whether it's in three days or three weeks, um, there's been a number of movies where we only have a week. That's kind of our standard uh, indie time now is about a week for a film. But then I've worked on films like The Revenant, where there was you know, 14 to 16 weeks of color correction on that movie and 12 to 15 roto artists working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. So the term color correction can vary a lot. And unfortunately for people watching the show or watching the product, they don't know whether you've done that in three days or whether you've done that in three weeks. And so that's, that's, that's a big challenge in how you manage that and manage that expectation. Um, along with that is, um, you know, helping, helping the storytelling. So <clears throat> we have, if you have three days, you may not be able to do some fine detail work to help the storytelling. But if you have three weeks, you can really look at it in a different perspective and do things a little differently. So <clears throat> those are all things that a colorist needs to manage and needs to think about before you ever do anything on the software or make any images or do anything like that. Um, Color correction kind of breaks down into two areas. So it breaks down into primary grading and secondary grading. And basically what that is, is a primary grade is something that's gonna affect the entire image. So if I saturate, uh, add saturation, add contrast, um, maybe add a blue wash or a, a gold wash, yellow wash, something like that, and it affects the whole frame, that's a primary correction. And then a secondary correction would be if we're just uh, affecting a part of the frame. So we may use keying to just affect like the classic is the color of a shirt or the color of a skin. Um, or we'll use power windows and I'll show you some of that this that stuff when we get there. Um, you know these these circles and squares or sometimes very articulated shapes that we can use to manipulate a part of the frame. And that's also uh, what you have to think about when you know you have three days to do a project. You're not going to really get into heavy, heavy secondaries. Secondaries usually take a lot more time. Um, the Resolve has some really great tools with color curves that you can actually do secondary looks with primary corrections. So that's uh, one thing that I encourage people out there if you wanna learn, you know, one of the things that I think is unique about the Resolve is, is its curves. 
um, and I use those heavily and they, they allow you to work very fast. Um, so that's another thing that uh, you can look at. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, some things here in the resolve. So let's switch over. So <clears throat> very often, we're gonna start here with just our basic image. So let's go ahead and delete this. So this is <clears throat> shot on Aerie Alexa. So this is Aerie Wide Gamut Log C uh, footage. And we're just gonna start first by putting on a LUT that the manufacturer provides and says, this is what the camera shot. So if we put on uh, this LUT here, you can see this, and let me go ahead and show you full screen here. So this is what comes straight out of the camera with the LUT that the camera manufacturer provides. So it's a semi-pleasing image to start. It's got some balance to it, and you know it doesn't really tell you much, but this is uh, what all the colors that are available, and that's one of the things that the Alexa LUT in particular, what a lot of people will refer to as Rec 709 LUT, um, does. It's giving you all of the colors you shot, everything available. So if we were to, let's just start color correcting on this here for a second. So if we were to look at this, we have uh, here on the scopes, we have basically our peak white and our peak black, zero and 1023. So if we look at what's happening on the scopes, we're not actually using our full dynamic range. Now you don't always have to use your full dynamic range, but um, it's a good idea to look and see what you are using. So let's start off with just taking this and adding a little bit of contrast to it. And we're gonna clean up our blacks a little bit here. And let's give it a little bit of brightness here. And we're gonna add, wind down some mids. Okay, so then you can see this is where we started. Let's see. And, and now we've added a little bit of snap contrast to it and we're using a little more dynamic range. Now you can see here on the bottom, you know, we're, we're, we're blowing some things out. So we may want to go in and, and um, start manipulating some of that down. I'm going to go ahead and shrink this window down so you guys can see everything here. There we go. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and go in and we're going to make sure that we're not clipping out our top end here. All right, so we're going to bring that down. Okay, so this is a fairly balanced image using the Rec. 709 LUT that uh, Aerie provides us. So let's go ahead and save that. We're going to just save that for a minute. So let's take a minute back and look at some storytelling. So we're just going to look at this image and try to, let's look at the whole shot here. So what do we know about this? We don't know anything about the project. We just see that there's a man coming out of a house. There's a woman. This is an older looking house, but do we know whether it's period or not? We don't know. You could find a lot of houses in LA like this. So <clears throat> this, this image doesn't really tell us much on our own. Now, if I tell you the context of this image, you'll get a little more grasp on what it is. This is a period piece um, that is supposed to be in World War II era. So this look that comes out of the Rec. 709 is not very period piece. So let's try something different. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people do, a lot of colorists do, is they want to emulate film and they want to emulate what film did. And film had some very interesting characteristics to it, what it did to highlights, what it did to shadows, as well as its grain and, 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 and uh, weave that it also had. So let's go ahead and we're gonna try, these are just the standard, um, some of the standard LUTs that come in from the Resolve, with the Resolve. So let's go ahead and try the Fuji. This is a, a LUT that's emulating Fuji. Now you'll see, it, at first, it kind of comes out, it's kind of flat, it doesn't really have a lot of life to it. So let's go ahead and add some, some life to it. And let me go back to add a log. Let's go ahead and add a little bit of life here. And, and we're gonna about clean up our blacks here, get our blacks nice and deep. And we're gonna just give it a little bit more brightness. 
And then let's add a little bit of saturation to it. So now we're starting to get somewhere. So let's go ahead and show you this full screen. So now we're starting to get into a different looking image. Now, if you look at these as what we always call single, single stimulus, which is looking at one thing at a time, um, you may not really notice much difference between this and Rec. 709. Um, so let's, so here, let's grab this and I'm going to show you this. So everybody take a quick visual look. This is just a very quick look with, the film LUT. Now if we go back and we put on what we did first, you can see the difference. And actually let's grab a still and I can show you them together. So you'll see here. So at first, if you look at them single stimulus, you may not have noticed a whole lot of difference. But now if you compare them, they're quite different. So here we have the Alexa LUT which is going to use all those colors of that digital camera, which is really going to give you a wide range and lots of saturation. And then when you look at the film LUT, it's retaining that in because film didn't quite have all of the range and colors that some modern cameras like an Alexa would. So you can see that's, that's the basic starting point. So for me, starting a project, usually what I'll do is I'll try to find what LUT I'm going to use and I try to find a good uh, starting point, a good primary grade. So this is, this is not a bad place to start with this uh, film let. So what I'll do is I'll, let's take that and let's go back and let's go ahead and apply this to some other shots and see what we get. So now I'll just take this and we will put this across this entire film. Now the, the name of the, this film is Heed the Call. And let's see, apply. So now we've taken that look and we've applied that look across everything. Now we're still going to have to go through and do some um, some manipulation per shot because obviously every shot's going to have a little bit different brightness, a little different saturation, a little bit of different color. And now that I'm looking at this, I can see that you know this is a little still a little too colorful. It's maybe still a little too warm in the bottom end for a, for a period film where you really want to kind of invoke that feeling that it's old. So let's go ahead and change that. We're going to go ahead in here and we're going to uh, add a little bit of uh, desaturation. And at the same time, we're going to cool off a little bit on the bottom end, a little bit of the blacks. All right. And now we're going to go through and we're going to kind of look at things shot by shot. So here you can see, even though I had set my white Point and my black point with that outdoor shot, when I get here, things are a little different. So we're going to go through and we're going to start kind of pulling stuff together, setting, setting the contrast to be right. And you would carry this, this idea the whole way, whole way through. So we're losing a little dark here. We want to be able to see our dominoes. And you, you always are thinking as a colorist, what's best for the shot, what's best for the story. You know, in a, in a feature you're looking at, in an episodic or feature, you're always looking at the actors. If you're a commercial colorist, you're always looking at the product. It's always about, you know, making those look good, making them uh, tell the story correctly. So as we start going through here, you can see here. So now we'll start to see these coming through together. And we're going to go ahead and look at the colors here. So you can see is now that we've even used this one shot and we put it across everything, the palette between shot to shot is changing quite a bit, probably from the time of day that these were all shot at, the color temperatures of the light is changing as the day is moving on. So, you know, one of the first things that a colorist should do is go through and balance the images and make them uh, uh, together and make them seem like they are in one. So you can see just between these two shots, we have a lot more warmth here and a lot uh, less warmth here. So let's go ahead and add some warmth in here. And now you can see these two shots pull together and look a lot more like they belong together. Um, let's go down a little further here. So we had looked originally looked at this shot and thought that this looked pretty good. Let's take a look here. So the, this is now feeling a little green to me. So we're going to go ahead and take a little of that green out, 
balance the image back. So you can see they don't quite match just yet. So we've got to make those two come together. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So the first basic, uh, I like to work in what I always refer to as passes. So the first basic pass that I'll do is a primary grade pass where we go through and we basically get just a few nodes on every shot and we get everything pulled into the, to the, the right color palette and we make everything feel cohesive, make it feel like it was all shot together. We start to establish the time of day um, and anything that's going along uh, story-wise. So let's take a look. So we should set those looks here. Uh, let's look in here. So we applied that same look throughout this whole show. Now, once we get into the interiors, that is not really looking very well. So let's go back and take that color off. And let's try something else. So let's see if we go back to, uh, let's go back to that Alexa and see what Alexa does for us in here. So here is what the Alexa Rec 709 comes through. And you can see the blacks are a little muddy on the bottom end. So let's go ahead and clean that out. So we'll, first we'll go through and just kind of balance our blacks. And we'll pull that together. And then this overall feels a little, little warm. So let's pull a little bit of that warmth out. And that's starting to feel a little bit better. So you can see here, if we go, and then control. Let's do this. So again, where we started, where we're going. Now you can see here, let me show you on the scopes here. One of the things a colorist is always looking at is detail. So you can see here, when you see the log image, you have all your detail. There's all this detail at the bottom end here. You want to really retain that unless you're creatively, uh, for some reason, taking that out. So let's take a look. So we've dropped all that down to zero. And you can see we just set it down there so that we retain all our detail. And we're going to balance it just a little bit more. Now, in, in your blacks, a lot of times, in order to have a balanced image, you'll see that red, green, and blue line up at the bottom. Um, so this gives black the uh, perception of true black. You know, if I wanted to have a blue wash in the blacks, as I go through, you'll see the, the blacks, uh, the blue channel gets lifted, the red channel dives, and the green kind of stays where it is, and now we've got this much bluer, colder looking image. So let's go back. So this is a primary correction. Uh, you're going to get that down, you're going to lay that down, and sometimes, like we were talking about schedules, sometimes with schedules, you can only really do primaries. I've had post supervisors make that requirement where we're not doing windows and power windows, um, and sometimes that's okay, sometimes that's not, or we use them just to save things. Um, so let me show you, go ahead and show you uh, uh, some secondary corrections here. Let's... Uh... So we can take, what we do usually with secondaries is we're trying to shape the image into something or draw your eye to a certain spot. So this is all about, this shot's going to be all about our actor here. So we want to really bring your eye to him and make sure that you're paying attention to him. So one of the things that we'll do a lot of times is we'll create depth with uh, power windows. So this is a typical power window. It's a circle. Uh, what it's doing is it's got a inner softness and an outer softness and you'll see here the inner circle here is uh, where the feathering begins and the outer circle is where the feathering ends. So if we go through and let's just set this out here and we're going to go ahead and everything around him we're going to take down brightness a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and drop that down. And so now, when you get to the shot, you're going to see that it's much more focused. Your eye is going to go much more focused to him. So this is one of the probably basic and most used uh, secondary corrections. Now, you can really get crazy with power windows and do a lot of things. Um, 
there's circles, there's uh, squares, and then we can also draw our own shapes. So let's find another shot. Let's look at this shot. So if we wanted to just bring um, down these walls and kind of some things around our character here, I can take a bezier and start to go down and maybe just draw around this spot here. So let's go ahead and feather this a little bit. We'll feather it in and let's start to take down that wall back there a little bit. So we'll just drop the brightness down around her. And we may need to add a little more feathering to it. Get it in. And another classic vignette that is on almost every movie you've probably ever seen is uh, what is referred to as a vignette. So we'll go ahead and we'll add another node here. And we're gonna take a circle and we're gonna kind of stretch it out. So we're gonna do like a classic, what we'd call a corner pinch vignette. So we're gonna take the corners down. So we'll go here and we will bring down, let's add some softness. All right, so now you'll see we're adding a little bit more shape, a little bit more dynamic nature to it. Um, sometimes on sets, a lot of times the top, you know, everyone lights from the top because it's uh, a good, great place to hide lights. So a lot of times another good vignette is to add what we call a topper. So we'll take this and uh, flatten out the shape. And we may take down just this little bit of the top frame here. And we'll go take that down. Okay, so here we go. We started with an image that was pretty flat, didn't have much depth to it. And just by using a few shapes, we're able to first do a little bit of a pinch vignette on it. So you can see here what's what's happening here as we bring it in. And then maybe a little extra at the top to make it not feel like it's top lit. And then that wall back there, we wanna kind of bring it down to, to, to brighten her. Now, you know, there's um, also a lot of windows that happen uh, to uh, bring actors out of dark scenes. So let's see if we can find another shot here. Let's try this. Let's go. So if we look at this shot, this left corner of the room is, is getting pretty dark and it may be a little hard to see. So let's go ahead and add a little bit of um, brightness on that corner that we can go through. And just brighten these areas over here. So you can see before we really couldn't see any detail back there. Now there's quite a bit of detail that's coming out. And then one of the things we're able to do with these power windows is we're able to track them. So it's very easy for us to grab a tracker and have the computer follow this window. So we can get this window to stay where we need it to. And as long as someone's not crossing it too much left or right, you, should, you shouldn't see it. So you can see it pretty, pretty natural, you know, overall. And if we go back before, you can see there was a lot of detail being lost. You couldn't really see things. So you can do, do that one for brightness, um, sometimes to darken things. Um, a lot of times, let's find another shot here. We're doing that same thing with faces. So let's find a different look here. Let's go ahead and we're gonna grade this a little bit here.
So we want to make sure that our windows, a lot, you'll see a lot of times people leave windows looking like this, very hot, very blown out. Sometimes they're captured like that, sometimes they're color corrected like that, but to me that's a technical mistake. Um, you shouldn't have your photography clipped. Um, and when we talk about clipped or crushed, clipped is usually the top end, so you can see we're clipping out all that detail. And when we talk about crushed, we're talking about the bottom end, and we're crushing out detail in the black. So those are sometimes some looks. There's definitely some colorists that do that on the regular as part of their looks. Um, me personally, I feel that that's uh, not the best for photography because it's not natural to photography. Photography doesn't do that. Um, so let's go ahead and look. So with a few windows, let's see what we can do here. A few secondary windows. So let's go ahead and and do our what we were talking about with our corner vignette here. Let's bring this up. Add a little bit of depth overall. And let's go ahead and take a look at that. And that's starting to feel a little bit better, but I still feel like the actor isn't coming forward. And a lot of times what you're trying to do with windows is create a depth with 2D uh, images. So let's take another window and add that onto our actress here. Just give her a little bit of brightness and maybe a little bit of contrast. And uh, let's see here. So if we were able just to set this over and give her a little bit more contrast. And maybe a little more color. So now we've kind of added that in without having to affect the whole scene overall or the whole shot overall. So let's go ahead and look. Let's grab a still of that. And then so you can see, so this is where we started and just adding in, you know, very flat and just adding in some windows, we're able to put a little bit of depth and light into it. So you see there before and after. And sometimes, you know, we also use windows to control uh, skin tones. Um, I don't do a lot of keying myself, um, only when necessary but let me show you what a key looks like. So let's say, let's find another shot here. Okay, let's see here, let's find. Okay, so let's say we wanted to change the color of this red uh, shirt. We, we like this grade, let's put a little bit of, a little bit more contrast in it. And let's balance that out. Okay, so now the next thing we can do, one of the, the other very uh, normal uh, second, secondary corrections is a key. So we're gonna go ahead and add another node here. And we're gonna go ahead and sample this color. So we're gonna go sample this red shirt and we're gonna have it show us just what we're grabbing. So the resolve will show us what areas we're affecting and we can refine that some. So let's see if we can get it to be a little bit closer, get more of that shirt. Okay, so let's see. So now if we wanted to, we have the ability to go and mess with just what we've selected. So we can really just start turning down those areas. And you'd have to go spend a little more time to refine this key to get it to where it got the whole shirt, but I think you guys get the idea. Um, let's see, what else can we do? Um, you know, that a lot of times uh, with keying, we also can combine that with windows. Um, you can see here the, the window will define where we're keying in, so we can use that to, to, to help what visual effects artists would refer to as like a garbage mask. So we can often use these, these uh, power windows as garbage masks as well, so that we don't affect any area outside. Let's say there was another red shirt in the scene that we didn't want to affect. We could separate them by using uh, windows as garbage masks. Um, another thing that uh, we do a lot, let's see if we can find a shot, is we do a lot of, um, uh, in color, we do a lot of camera 
moves, whether it's adding or taking away. So here we have a shot, it's pretty static. Uh, maybe we wanna add a little bit more life to it. So what we can do is we can go in and start adding in some uh, sh sizing here to it. Let's go ahead and And I'll just show you something very simple. So this would just be a very simple dynamic move here over a little bit of time. So, you know, these are all things that are available to you in the color tools. So that's adding motion to a, uh, a shot. Um, a lot of times what we want to do is we want to add uh, take away motion. Let's see if we can find a shot and we'll do some stabilizing. So let's see here. So there's a little bit of movement here in the shot. And let's say we wanted it to actually be a lockdown. So we can go in and actually choose to stabilize it. And now you'll see there won't be, oh, well, there shouldn't be movement. The resolve has uh, taken its own mind there. Um, let's find, see if we can find another one. Uh, let me go ahead and... Let's see how it'll do on this one. So we've taken a little bit of that, that motion out. Let's try to see if we lock, were to lock it down and tell the resolve. We want this to be a static shot. Now you can see there's, there's no camera move left whatsoever. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of different, uh, complexities to color correction, but that's kind of a quick kind of overview of what we're doing. A lot of times we're just shaping an image with windows, um, you know, checking keys and skin tones and making sure, helping the story along, uh, and, 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 you know, helping to fix production. You know, if you shot a, a scene, um, over a course of three days outside, the light's going to change a lot, the temperature's going to change a lot. So that's, you know, we can go through and balance a lot of that and get it through. Um, you know, then there's, I wanted to show one more thing before we move into some questions. Uh, let's see, let's wipe all that out. So along that same lines, it, with color, everyone thinks color correction is color, but there's always the option to do black and white. So with this particular project, um, I thought that it would be a very interesting look to go ahead and switch into black and white and give it a different mood. So I went ahead and set this and the resolve is some very cool tools to make black and white images. So you can see here, there's a, we had um, some kind of some dark areas here. So I went through and added some windows, added a little bit of contrast and a little bit of sharpening so that you could see the areas. Um, here we had uh, the coffee mug was kind of the brightest thing in the, in the frame and, our focus is supposed to be on the radio, so we can go in and, and uh, drop that down. So it's kind of interesting, and I wanted to show you one thing that I think is unique about the Resolve that I don't see in a lot of other programs. Um, the Resolve has the ability to make a black and white image by mixing the RGB channels together. And if I can find it, Let's see here, it is here. So what you have here is you have a red, green, and blue channel, and the Resolve, we've mixed them to monochromatic, so that's made this black and white image, and we can actually mix those together to get different things. It's very similar to the way black and white film works by putting red, green, blue, yellow uh, filters in front of the lens. You can enhance different areas uh, using, depending on how you mix these RGB channels together. So you get a much more dynamic uh, black and white image um, than just, say, taking out all the saturation. You're actually kind of mimicking um, film. And then, you know, for something like this, we may go and add a little bit of grain to it. So we have our grain tool here in the Resolve. So we can go ahead, and I don't know how good you'll see this on the web, so I'm going to crank the grain up. So you can see now we've added some grain to it. We've made a much more filmic looking black and white image. I'm a big fan of black and white. Um, unfortunately, doesn't really sit well in uh, modern society today. But uh, every, every couple of years we get a black and white film that uh, sticks out, which is, which is great. Um, let me show you one other thing. Um, 
two two ways uh, that a lot of colorists work to um, how how we're getting our media. So right now we're working in what's called a uh, pre-conform workflow. So I was given this as a QuickTime. Let me see and uh, let me see where is this. So I was given this as one QuickTime. So this whole show was already conformed in the Avid and back to its original files and was given to me just as this one piece. And then what they do is they give me an EDL and I take that EDL and I add in all the edits. So you'll see down here on the color page or on the edit page, you'll see all of these edits are actually just added. So that allows us to go through and, and do individual shots. The other way that a lot of colorists work is what's called clip mode, uh, clip based. So we'd actually have every shot that you shot separately and we'd be conforming in the resolve and uh, actually putting things together that way. Um, one other thing, let's go, let's just show you one other thing. So we were talking about story and what you're able to do with color correction and how you're able to change the mood. Uh, this is a television show that I do on HBO called Room 104. Uh, it's an anthology series. Um, it's, every episode is different. Every episode has a different story, a different mood, a different feel. Um, so we actually take this room and we make it look very different in every episode. Uh, and you can see here, kind of just go through and show you some of the different looks. So this show's very particular because we are in one room, we want things to feel different. So, you know, the room may look soft and, and pink and magenta in one, one uh, episode, and it may be a lot more yellow and cold um, in, in different episodes. Uh, you know, here we have, this was a, st a story about um, uh, the maid kind of having a, a, a visualization of her childhood and, and her life. So you can see this is some of the looks that we did. And a lot of these looks we come up with before they shoot. And we do that in the Resolve and we make LUTs uh, in the Resolve. And then they shoot with those LUTs and then we come back and we do final color through them. And this show is really fun because we get to really push a lot of limitations and a lot of things. So you'll see here... Um, some some kind of normal and then we have a couple uh a couple that comes here for their they came here 50 years ago for their honeymoon and now they're here again to relive that so we've gone very warm so you'll see it's a lot warmer um we also have an episode that takes place in the 60s here we wanted this to feel old and have a lot less saturation to it so we went ahead and and uh, push that not only through the art direction, but through the uh, color correction. And you'll see here a very stark palette, which if you've ever seen the show, mimics the storytelling. And then we'll have other episodes where, you know, we just want to kind of create a, a little bit of a, of a creepy feel. So we'll go with a little more green, um, always trying to preserve the skin tones and keep those playing correctly. And then we've had, we had an episode that took place in the 90s. So we landed up using framing for part of that. So this episode comes out four by three. So you can see we've pillar boxed it. Um, we wanted this to feel like it was from the 90s. So we went back and uh, did, did some looking at some things, some movies from the 90s and, and kind of mimic those looks that we saw. Just kind of a very plain palette, you know, it was before color correction was really being pushed far. And then, so you can see this one room changes just based on color quite a bit. And here we have another episode where we've gone heavy with green to try to create, a, again, a, an eerie feeling. And this is a mixture of lighting and color correction. All right, so there's the nickel tour of, uh, of uh, the art of color grading and some of the tools that we use. Um, do we want to try to open up some questions? 
Sure, um, and we do have um, quite a few of the uh, questions, so we'll uh, get to as many as we can. Um, if we're not able to answer all of the questions, uh, would we be able to send them to you and ask you to respond via email or whatever? Absolutely. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Nick. Um, first question, uh, and unfortunately the person uh, just left, but uh, uh, Ryan and, uh, let's see, uh, one other person asked a similar question. Um, is it common for a, a director to set a specific color reference set before starting the color correction process, or do they all start with the same reference point or calibration and work from there? And the uh, uh, Greg also asked, uh, do most let's see, uh, oh, do most features you work on uh, create the lot with the DP on the set and require you to use it? It so let's start with the first one. Um, a lot of directors will rely on their DP to set a visual look, and a lot of times nowadays there's a lookbook created before they even start shooting. So a lot of times there's reference images. It's usually a lot of still photographers, um, a lot of ad campaigns, uh, frame grabs from past movies. So they'll put together a lookbook that kind of gives you the palette, whether it's a, a warm feel very contrasty. Um, you'll find a lot of David Fincher movies in almost every one of those lookbooks that come through because his movies stand out so much. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of it starts that way. Um, some DPs are very technical savvy and they will actually take their images from set and they will color correct them, you know, just a few still frames here and there and color correct what they're thinking. And then, you know, you take that and you apply that and you run with that. Um, it really does vary, um, but I would think that most most of the creatives I work with kind of come in with an idea of what they're looking for, and then it's your job to, to translate that to screen and then carry it through an entire movie. Um, a lot of times it's just, just still frames. They don't you know, actually do any moving images or anything like that. Um, and, and a lot of cinematographers look at still photographers for inspiration because still photographers can really push the boundaries uh, a little bit more than cinema, cinematographers can for those kind of pushed looks and where they're going. And then sometimes we'll start with those heavy looks and put them on and then you realize, okay, this, is, this was great in a still, but looking at that for five minutes becomes way too much. And so we'll rein that back and kind of pull that in um, what was the second the second part to that? Um, it was oh, on uh, set. Um, a lot yeah, of DP on set. Uh, on set um, we we at Technicolor we have great uh, color management, so that's one of the reasons uh, a lot of people like to come to us. So we'll uh, usually have that worked out ahead of time. Um, depends on uh, the cameras too. Sometimes we're doing camera matching. Um, I recently had an instance where someone was going to shoot a, uh, a Panavision DXL, but they wanted it to feel like uh, an Alexa 65. So they went and shot some images on the Alexa 65 and the DXL side by side, and we kind of figured out the difference between the two, and then we're able to take that and make a LUT that went, went into the DXL to make the DXL uh, mimic the uh, Alexa 65. Um, I don't very often get cinematographers that come in with their own LUT and force us to use it. Uh, I am usually against that because we don't know what those LUTs will do as we go through the different color spaces. So wow. instead what I prefer to do is look at what they've done with that LUT and then mimic that look using the color science that I know and trust and that I know I can get from DCI-P3, Direct 709, Direct 2020, through all those spaces, because some of those LUTs are made on set, you know, on a monitor and a little tent on a little monitor, and you don't know how that's actually going to translate through the whole entire process. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. In your work with uh, DPs, do you find you need to have familiarity with lenses, color specs, light, uh, lighting setups, etc., or can you simply ignore all that when dealing with the DPs? In other words, how much knowledge of cinematography do you think is helpful? I think it's hugely helpful. Um, for me, I rely on it greatly. Um, my passion and what got me into this was photography. So I do have a photography degree, but I don't think that you have to have that. Um, knowing a lot of colorists, there's some colorists that don't know anything about lenses, you know, um, and some that do. I can sit down and talk about master primes and cooks and, 
you know, Zeiss's all day long with DPs. So that's something good for me because it's a relatable subject that I can talk to the DPs with. But mm. I don't think that that's a necessary skill to have to be a good colorist. Um, you know, knowing knowing the people, knowing what they like, and being able to get an image they want fast is 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 probably a better asset than you know knowing everything about the cameras and things like that. I mean, you do need to know a little bit of general information about the cameras and depth of field and some things like that. But um, I think for the most part, you don't have to have a cinematographer's level of understanding of that. Okay, good. Um, early on, you were talking, uh, I have a question here uh, about uh, perf screens. Um, does perf stand for perforated? Yes. Okay, here's the question. Um, if you are concer uh, concerned about not color grading on a perf screen because the non-perf screen is more accurate for color grading, is there concern over your work being displayed in, for instance, IMAX, con uh, considering based on their description, he assumes IMAX screens are perforated? Yes. Um, it's, the, the perf will, will usually land up causing a moray. So that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we don't necessarily use it. It's not so much that the color accuracy is different. It's just that um, the perfs usually will, will add to, uh, it'll often make the image look uh, noisy, um, noisier than it is. So, you know, out in the world, we can't really hold that for cinemas and what they have. You just kind of got to go with it. But in the grading environment, you know, we're trying to create this perfect environment so you can see everything as best as possible. So it, it does affect an image, but it doesn't necessarily affect its color rendition. It's more of its uh, the way it looks noise wise. And sometimes, you know, shirts or things get a, get a moire or a rainbow kind of effect from, from mm -hmm. the perfs. Okay. Um, what is color timing? Color timing, um, it's funny, this, this kind of comes up. So there's a number of terms now that people use, color timing, color correction, color grading. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll hear different people, people will say, oh, well, if you're just, you know, fixing an image, it's color correction. But if you're creating something uh, creative, it's color grading. Um, in my experience, most of us interchange all three of those words and it's all the same thing. It's all just color correction, you know, whether you're, fixing something or doing something creative. Um, most of the time, because I work in a more feature world, uh, we refer to things as color grading because that's the way everyone uh, referred to it back when film. And I think that comes from, um, there was different grades made. You would off, a lot of times try different grades on one image and see what happened through a lab. And so I think that's where grading comes from. But for the most part, all of those are, the, all three of those terms, at least to me and most of the people I know, are the same. They're interchangeable. Got it. Got it. Uh, let's see. Um, Anne asks, uh, it appears you're taking the camera output, applying the LUT, and then adjusting the color. Uh, my understanding is to put uh, color correction between the camera output and the LUT, like 709. There, <clears throat> there is uh, different degrees to working that way. So. If you're working on a theatrical project, a lot of times you will stay behind the lot. And um, it's kind of dealer's choice whether you want to stay 100% behind the lot or uh, in front of it. They do have a different feel because you're color correcting. If you're behind the lot, you're color correcting on a log image usually. If you're color correcting in front of the lot, you're color correcting on a linear image, and those definitely have a different feel when you get into um, the tools. Um, there really is no right or wrong unless your client has a deliverable that requires it. Uh, one of the biggest content providers in the world now is Netflix, and Netflix wants to, you to provide them with what they call a graded archived master. And what that is is that's basically your color corrections in the native space of the camera with the LUT taken off. So if you've now gone and colored after that, you can't necessarily provide that deliverable easy. So you kind of got to know what you do, uh, what you need to deliver, and what your clients are expecting. Um, if I'm doing a feature like that, I often will change the way I work. So if I'm doing a feature that I know is going to do that, I'll stay up completely between the camera output and that LUT uh, so that all the work is happening behind the LUT. But for a broadcast show that's not going to require that, 
I may work in both, and it's a lot of times faster to do fine details in the blacks and the highlights after the LUT. So it's dealer's choice, but you kind of got to know where your project's going. There's some broadcast colorists I know that only color after the LUT. So it's it varies from colorist to colorist. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's one. Uh, Bert asks, uh, do you ever find yourself using the lighting or beauty tools within Resolve? Um, yeah, I do use a little bit of the beauty tools. Um, we use, um, let me see if I can show that actually real quick. Let me find a shot here. So if we wanted to, let's say we wanted to just clean this up. So first let's go ahead and ooh, let's wipe this out. So the Resolve has a great beauty tool. It's called Face Refinement. And what I can do is I can go in here and analyze the shot. And it will find the different parts of the face, whether it's the eyes, nose, ears, mouth. And then I have different controls over that. And let's see, I think. So we can go ahead and smooth the skin, her skin. We can sharpen her eyes. So we can go ahead and just, just do a little eye sharpening um, and do some of these. Now, the way I use this now, a lot of times is last minute. I'm lucky that the productions I work on usually will take care of this stuff ahead of me. So usually that beauty work is done by visual effects artists. But um, we do, from time to time, uh, use that, that beauty fix tool. Um, and it's great. It's great in a pinch. It's, it's really fun. I'm blessed that usually that's handled by VFX artists before it gets to me, which is good because <laughs> it allows me just to focus on color. And that's one other thing, you know, about um, learning color, what you can do in the color bay. You know, the more you do things like that in a color bay, the less time you have to work on your color. Um, now, you may be you know, in an in-house situation where time is no factor, and then that's great, you can do them both. But um, luckily for me, somebody else gets to do that ahead of time. Okay, we got a few more questions here. Uh, let's see, is there a particular working color space in which you feel the tools in Resolve really feel most intuitive and help you get where you want to go quickly? And in parentheses, there's Rec 709, ACES, et cetera. Uh, the tools do, do, do feel different. Um, a lot of that is because in Resolve, your, your primary tool is Lift Gamma Game, which is based on a linear uh, uh, image. Um, but a lot of this stuff is a log image, so you may be using these linear tools on like a log C image. So that has a, a certain feel to it than if you had a camera that, let's say, shot natively Rec. 709. I think it's more about you getting used to it. I don't think there's one that gets you to a quicker place either way. Um, that's more of your LUT and your primary correction. I find that that's more important than your color space. Um, I'm also a big fan that if you can make something look good in Rec. 709, it will look good anywhere because Rec. 709 is a much smaller color space. And the way I try to uh, explain that to a lot of clients is you go into a recording studio and a lot of people have seen they have these huge giant $30,000 walls of monitors and then on top of the mixing console there's these two little white speakers and you'll hear the guys mixing on these two little white speakers and because if they can make it sound good there it will sound good everywhere and I think that's something with with Rec. 709. If you can make something look good in Rec. 709, it will look good everywhere. And in fact, one of the things that I recommend a lot to indie productions is if they don't have a lot of time, let's say we have a week to do their DI and they want a, you know, a DCP for festivals, but they also need something that can go for uh, Blu-ray and streaming and all that. What I'll a lot of times recommend is that they just work solely in Rec. 709. So we'll uh, work in Rec. 709 on the projector. We'll do it in a Gamma 2.4, and we'll do the whole DI that way on the projector. And then the last day or the last couple hours of the last day, we'll pop open a monitor and we'll look at it there. Um, the Resolve has a really, really, really great 
uh, Rec 709 to DCI XYZ conversion LUT in it that will, um, so if you work in Rec 709, you can then use that to make your DCP with, and that works fantastic. Um, I've personally used that LUT on 30 or 40 different features, sometimes some very, very big name features uh, when we're doing what we call previews. Um, where they come in with their admin material of their dailies. We do a quick pass through the movie just over a day just to kind of smooth it out. And then there I'll use the uh, Rec 709 to DCI XYZ LUT inside the Resolve to make what's called a DCDM um, or a, uh, the other way, if that's basically your uh, XYZ color space and that's what your, your DCP will be made from. So, um, you know, I wouldn't limit yourself to a color space. Um, just get used to working in one and then you can go from there. Okay, thank you. Um, we have three questions left in the queue and I think uh, we should probably um, say that these are the final three and then call it a night. Um, ha has two of these questions. Uh, is grading for HDR different than uh, SDR with HDR being a high dynamic range and SDR being standard dynamic range? And yes, also, also, do colorists and directors usually take advantage of a wider color gamut? Yes, there's a big difference in color correcting. Um, typically, your HDR image is uh, in what's called a PQ gamma. So it's, it's the only way that I can explain it is you actually have less uh, dynamic range to do your grading even though it's displaying on an image that has a higher dynamic range. So in a uh, linear color space, I may have, let's say, 0 to 1023, and I have all that room to do my color correction. So if I'm doing something in the bottom end of the signal, you know, that may be the bottom 100, uh, you know, points or whatever. On an HDR image, an HDR image is like 0 to... Um, like 512, we'll say halfway up the scale. So now all my color corrections have to be a lot finer, a lot mm -hmm. smoother, uh, a lot more precise. So it's definitely um, a lot tougher. The tools are changing for that. Um, one of the things that's changing in Resolve um, 15 is that you can put a node and tell it into a color space what color space you're in, and it will help fix that. So the controls won't be as fine, um, they'll be used to what you're using in, in like a normal Rec 709 gamma, but you're doing it in a PQ. So those tools, I think, are going to get there to where it's not as hard uh, to color correct an image in HDR as it is in SDR. So there's there's definitely a difference there. And it, on the other note, it's it's uh, I find that most people, unless you have a, a storytelling point to really use the HDR, we do not make the HDR we do not take full creative advantage of that mm -hmm. um, to the point where we've had studios I've done. Um, I did uh, uh, the post, um, the Steven Spielberg movie uh, last year, and all they wanted was their image that they were used to seeing in SDR to look at that same thing in, in HDR. So if you actually looked at uh, typically HDR, we talk about going to a thousand nits. If you were to look at uh, that particular movie, there's maybe peaks at 300, 350 at, mm -hmm. at most um, because they didn't want it to look HDR. They wanted the look of this classic film. But then there's other movies where, uh, you know, some of the Marvel movies, some of the superhero movies where they want that and they want to be able to take that and add this kind of hyper real look to it. And so they take it and push it. So, again, it kind of goes back to, I think, story and what works for the story. But I think for the most part, on my side of, of the theatrical things, most filmmakers aren't pushing the limits of HDR yet because they don't, uh, they're very set in what they like. And, okay. and a lot of times too, HDR is a secondary grade. So HDR is not your primary deliverable. So everyone works in SDR because that's what everyone mostly is going to see. And then they get used to that. And then when you go into HDR, it's kind of a shock to, you know, try to uh, uh, let those highlights go really high. Um, occasionally, we do what we call HDR, what some of us refer to as HDR light. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of, you know, using about half of that range and letting the practicals in the room, you know, feel like they're bright, but not letting the whole overall image uh, use that full HDR space that you have. Got it. Uh, let's see, uh, next to last question. With low pass filters in cameras, how do you deal with sharpening? 
Um, you, st you know, I only will sharpen if necessary. So if the focus is done on set correctly, um, I will never touch sharpening because I think that sharpening, sharpening adds contrast to edges. And a lot of times that will uh, not be very flattering to actors. Um, but I don't think I've ever taken, I don't think it's ever really affected it when I have had to. So you can, you can still sharpen pretty heavy if you need to. Okay. And our final question comes from Ha. Um, with 8K display coming out, will grain management workflow be different to minimize artifacts? Um, no, I wouldn't think so. I would think that it would stay the same. Um, I mean, even, even uh, a lot of images were still, even at the high end, we're still monitoring at the most at 4K. Most, most, most DIs are done displaying at 2K, even if we're working internally in 4K or 8K. Um, so, you know, even though you're starting with this canvas, this 8K canvas, you're still landing up in usually a 2K world. So it, it doesn't necessarily factor, factor in yet. Perfect. And that is our final question. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. I, I think our guests asked some very good questions and you had some awesome answers for them. Thank you. Our pleasure. So um, I'd like to take this opportunity not only to uh, thank uh, Nick, but also thank uh, Joseph uh, Schlomka uh, for uh, participating and speaking. Thank our moderators uh, for um, putting the uh, uh, thing together, the, when I say the thing, the webinar and uh, the demonstrations. I uh, also like to uh, thank uh, HPA for uh, allowing the uh, YEPs to put the thing, uh, the, the thing, I keep calling it a thing, the webinar together and uh, for um, uh, our guests who stuck with us here uh, till the end. Uh, it's getting uh, probably close to dinner time if it's not already. So thanks to all. Take care, safe travels, and we'll see you next time on the next Yep webcast. Mm -hmm.